Welcome to the Hello Mornings podcast, where our goal is to inspire and equip you to build a grace-filled, life-giving morning routine. My name is Kat Lee, and today we're talking about the power of rest with Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. She's going to share her own journey that brought her to the breaking point and how her research and experience helped her uncover the seven types of rest we all need and how we can start making changes today. Let's jump into our chat today with Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. Hey, Sandra, welcome to the Hello Mornings podcast. Hi, Kat. It's so nice to chat with you today. I I would love to really kind of just start out by diving into your story. I've often heard from people, actually in our our emails that we get from, from Hello Mornings readers and listeners, is we ask them what's their biggest obstacle to morning routines. And a lot of times they just say, I can't get out of bed, or I can't wake up, or I'm just too tired. And you talk a lot about rest. Um, So Mm -hmm. I kind of just want to start out by diving a little bit into who you are, and then your journey to rest. So tell us a little bit about you and your family just to get us started. Yeah, I'm an internal medicine physician. I practice near the Birmingham, Alabama area. I have two sons. They are um, 14 and 12 currently. And I'm a wife and an author. And what I found was really about, uh, let's see, maybe about 10 years ago now, I had this time when both of my sons were very small. One was about two, the other one was about four. And it was a time of my life when I, when I had a lot going on. You know, I was still active in my medical practice, uh, very active in it at that time, doing a lot of new things. And then having two kids that were in that toddler age range, I just really got to the point where I was overwhelmed and eventually burned out. And that's really where my rest journey started at. It started at that place of being burned out and trying to figure out how to get my life back on track. Um, I know I knew I didn't want to give up my medical practice. That's where my passion is. That's what I love. That's what I felt God's calling on my life was about. So that wasn't an option. I really just needed to see how to create um, a routine, a lifestyle that enabled me to be able to rest and to still feel whole and happy. So what are some of the first steps that you did to get there? Because you mentioned you are a doctor and you're a wife and you're a mom and an author. That's a lot of stuff. And most people think of all those things and just thinking about it makes them a little bit tired. So as you thought through that, did you initially think, well, I need to I need to give something up? Obviously not the middle ones, but. Right, I did. And, and that's the thing. When I was thinking about what can I give up? Even the things that, like, say, for instance, we were doing a Bible study at that time, and we had started the Bible study, my husband and I, for young couples, we started it before we had kids. So at the time we started it, it was a great thing. We had people over our house all the time. We were kind of the hangout place. We were mentoring and discipling, but we didn't have kids, and kids really changed everything (laughs) because we didn't have that kind of time anymore, and it this wasn't acceptable for people to just drop by, you know, at 10 o'clock at night if they had an issue or something. So, so it really, some things, there were some things that had come to an end and they were good things and they were a season in our life and they had come to their end, but we weren't willing to let them go, even though they were straining, uh, straining us in every way. So there were some hard choices that had to be made, but a lot of the things that were giving me the most pressure were things that were blessings I'd prayed for. You know, my marriage, my kids, my career, these are things I prayed and asked God for. And so they definitely weren't things I was going to be giving up. So it was a matter of looking at how can I find rest in the middle of all of this busyness? Because the busyness from the blessings wasn't going away. I needed to figure out how was I going to rest in the in that process to make it something that wasn't this side thing that I did on the weekend or that I just did on vacations, but it became a part of who I am. It became a part of one of the scriptures that comes to mind often when I think about rest is that I, it, it, I wanted an abiding rest where it was a day-to-day process, a, a routine where I was daily abiding in the rest of God and I had to figure out what that looked like for me. So I think a lot of women listening can relate because they have a lot of things going on in their lives and they can't necessarily drop any of them. And for most of us, when we think of rest, the first thing we think of is sleep. (laughs) So a lot of people listening are moms, maybe with young kids. 
you know, how, how, how they can't get more sleep. So tell us a little bit about the difference between rest and sleep. Well, that's the thing. That's what I thought too. I thought, well, okay, I, I'm tired because I got a four and a two year old. So I'm waking up all hours of the night. And even when I had those days where I could get, you know, seven, eight hours of sleep, I was still tired. And so, you know, sleep is a part of it. But what most of us don't really understand is that sleep and rest are not the same thing. We use those two words interchangeably and they shouldn't be because it it creates this thought process that I can only get rest if I get more sleep. And sleep is just one type of rest. And even at that, it's just a, a portion of that type. There, what I found is I was looking through the scripture and looking through science and research is that there really are seven different types of rest that are available to us. And sleep is one type of physical rest with physical rest being divided up into both passive and active. So we have passive like sleeping and napping, but we also have active physical rest like leisure walking or prayer walking, some people call it, where you're not trying to walk for um, exercise benefit, but you're doing it more as a uh, ability to increase your circulation and increase your lymphatics and de- and de-stress your muscles. So massage, um, things like dynamic stretching exercises, all of those things fit under that, what we call active physical rest. And, and like I said, there's seven different types of physical just being one portion. So the problem is so often I'll have patients come in that say, you know, I'm sleeping well, but I'm still, I still feel drained. I still Mm -hmm. feel overwhelmed. I still feel tired. And so what I usually ask them is, have you really evaluated what type of tired you are? Because it's not just physically tired. You know, are you mentally tired? Are you socially tired? Are you emotionally, you know, creatively? Where is it that you're pouring out in your life that you have yet to recognize that you need to pour back into? Okay, I'm just I'm just gonna say I'm totally nerding out. I love the trifecta. I, maybe it's not a trifecta because I can't think of the third thing. But where faith and scripture come together with science and research, I guess trifecta, and 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 then the practical application of it. I just love that combination of it. So I am loving what you're talking about here. You mentioned a few of the types of rest. Can you just list all seven for us? Yes, they are physical, mental, spiritual emotional, social, sensory, and creative. Which one of those was the one that you needed the most? The one that I was having the biggest issue with was emotional. Um, With emotional rest really having to do with our ability to eliminate people-pleasing behaviors and to just really speak our truth, to be authentic about what we're feeling in the moment. I had, um, as I mentioned, we were, you know, leading a Bible study at the time. I didn't want to feel like I was letting those people down. I knew that we had become a part of their life. They become a part of our lives, um, but our lives were actively changing. And so a part of me felt like I was letting them down and I wanted to continue to, to kind of please that circle. Even though I knew that that was something I felt like God was telling my husband and I that we needed to, to move away from that, 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 that our season of leading that had come to an end. And honestly, when we did finally make that decision that, you know, we need to tell the group that we we can't keep being kind of the center house where all of these things are taking place. Um, there was another couple just waiting to step in that mm-hmm. had no kids, you know, that were just, you know, they had helped. They'd been helping us with leading it as far as um, whenever we were at church services, some, if we were out of town or something came up, they were always the ones who were willing to jump in. And, and you know, really, God just showed me that. Sometimes we end up trying to take over situations where he is already moving. And so our our inability to just trust him in the process just slows down others getting blessings sometimes mm. because we are still kind of meddling with it <laughs> instead of trusting that he really does have a plan for it all. That's so good. Do you do you think do you think of yourself as a I don't know, maybe I would call it an excessively faithful person. Like if you, if there was a a grid, you would tend to lean towards, you know, faithful, maybe to your detriment sort of person. Is that why you guys hung on to that and it was hard to say no, or is just that just the place that you were in? I would probably say I lean more toward being a controlling type person. Mm. (laughs) I'm a planner with a capital P. I'm like, I'm the person who my husband always jokes on our honeymoon. We went to Hawaii I literally had every minute from eight o'clock to 8 p.m. planned. 
And he was like, that's a, that's not a honeymoon. <laughs> I'm like, but I'm a planner. I've never been to Hawaii before. There's all these things I want to do and want to see. So, so yeah, I'm like the ultimate planner. I like to know what's going to happen and have it all planned out and all nice and neatly packaged. And there's not a lot of faith in that. I mean, just to be honest, um, but that's my, my kind of normal personalities is to really control things. And I honestly think it's because I felt like I had so little control growing up. My, my back story is that my um, biological mother died in the hospital right after childbirth. And my father was in the military. So, you know, he went in with his wife to have, have this newborn and he left a widow. Mm-hmm. And so it's one of those things where I didn't, I didn't really feel like I had a lot of control in my childhood. I felt like things just happened to me. So uh, as an adult, I really tried to control things. If I even talk about in my book, Sacred Rest, uh, I think I fought rest so badly after my children were born because during um, the birth of my first child, I, I believe I kind of figured out what happened with my mother. I had this really unusual reaction to the anesthesia where they did the epidural and, you know, you're only supposed to be numb from the waist down. I went to sleep after the epidural and I woke up and I couldn't talk. I was numb mm. from my mouth down and I could barely breathe. And my husband was looking and, I, and he could just see the fear in my eyes because I couldn't say anything more. But I was able to mouth the words to him that, you know, I can't move. Something's happened to me. And obviously they ran around and reversed everything. But when your when your body is shut down and quieted to the point that you don't have control over it, I think I fought rest mm. because it it felt like death. Mm-hmm. It felt like something was was missing. Wow. Yeah. It's 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 so interesting to me because we have similar stories. Uh, my mother passed away when I was nine months old, so a little bit later. Mm-hmm. But you know, mm-hmm. and, and subsequently, so a single dad, and we moved, and there were lots of other factors. And it's just interesting how different people respond to those situations. I, I, you know, you talked about you being a planner and wanting the control. My reaction was I tended to be an overly faithful person, since so many people had kind of left my life. I found that I, I, I would you know, hold on to things and hold on to situations and people longer than possibly (laughs) needed to be. And so then I was stretching myself too far. And so the rest didn't come because I was giving myself so many places that probably didn't really even need me anymore. And Mm -hmm. I I love that we're able to come kind of from these both these different perspectives. I wouldn't, I do like to plan, but I tend to like to just try all the things too. And that's where my lack of rest comes from. And so for those listening, you know, there's just so many different ways you can arrive at this situation where you're, you're needing rest. Um, and, And with Helen Mornings, just our heart is just to connect you with Jesus, just first thing in the morning and let him be your place of rest. So for those listening, Sandra, who say, you know, either... I just don't sleep well, or my, you know, I have little kids, or my life is just crazy, and I want to start my day with Jesus, but I just can't get out of bed. I'm just so tired. What's some place that they could start? What's one thing that they could start with? Well, what I would recommend would be to start with a restful nighttime routine, because really how your body transitions from your busy day into trying to sleep will affect kind of the quality of your sleep. With sleep, you have the five different, you know, stages, the four stages of non-REM, and then the stage five REM sleep. The restoration, the, that feeling of, of, um, of being kind of restored in our sleep is most effective when we can get to stage three. So what I recommend for most people is to start looking at your nighttime routine. Are you doing, you know, Facebook or, or, you know, watching movies or things that are watching the news, things that are highly stimulating right before you go to bed? Because if you are, that's going to interfere with your ability to go into deeper sleep. Uh, What does your background setting look like where you're sleeping at? Are you making sure that whatever uh, clothing that you're wearing is not irritating to your body in any way? Doing a a brief self-analysis before you go to bed. Is there something that's hurting, that's tender, that's painful? Because oftentimes that lets us know kind of where where we pour it out physically during our day. Um, for instance, if someone's working at a desk or lifting a toddler all day long, they may not notice that their neck and their back and their shoulders hurt when they, until they lay down. While doing a quick self-analysis before you get into the bed, you can do kind of a little quick self-massage or let some hot water from the shower run 
over your shoulders before you go to sleep. So it's, the, it's just really small tweaks to a bedtime routine to make sure that those seven types of rest are being kind of addressed in a very short period of time. And it doesn't take very long. Yeah, I was so gonna... when I'm talking about a routine, it's like five minutes at the most. Okay. Yeah. So especially, you know, when you say, are you on Facebook? Are you watching TV? Those sort of things. How far in advance of going to bed do we need to take those out of our schedule? I, well, as far as the electronics, I recommend at least a 30 minute time frame. Some studies show that, that the further away you can get from it, the better. And so I don't disagree with that. But I do know that a lot of people, particularly if you have kids, you may not even get time to yourself until right. nine o'clock, nine thirty when you put them down. So what I find is if you at least have 30 minutes where you're not having the blue light and the screens and uh, the stimulation from a electronics, that gives your mind enough time to wind down, especially if you do the mental rest activities like um, what we call brain dumping, or if there's thoughts that are kind of ruminating in your head and your your background noise in your mind is kind of keeping you on edge about things that you um, don't want to forget, or you're kind of going over your to-do list for the next morning, to take that time to actually brain dump or to allow that information to be put in a concrete setting, like a journal or, or, you know, it could be a piece of, um, it could be a post-it note for that matter on the side of your nightstand where you're writing down anything that keeps coming back to your mind because the way the brain works, if there's something you're ruminating over, your mind thinks it's important. And so it, it says, I don't want to let Kat down. I've got to keep holding on mm -hmm. to this thought because otherwise she's going to let it go and then she won't remember it. But when you write it down, whether it's in a journal or just on a post-it note, it allows the mind to say, oh, okay, it's it's safely stored. Mm. So now I can release that. And then you're able to see, okay, what else is going around my, my thoughts? Because a lot of the negative thoughts that um, people tend to take to bed and think about over and over again, um, do they need to be processed? Absolutely. Do they need to be processed right before you go to sleep? Absolutely not. Because that's going to keep you from actually being refreshed the next morning so that you can get up and maybe during your prayer time with God process, why is it that I feel unworthy of this raise? Or why do I feel left out when my other girlfriends went on, on this trip? You know, nighttime is not when you process that. You jot it down. And then after you've done that nighttime routine, those are great things to take to God in the morning when you're having your morning time so that you can, can be open to listening to what he has to say. That's so good because how many of us lay our heads down and immediately, we might not have even thought of it um, since the night before when we laid our head down, but just this, you know, some heavy thing or um, just thinking about, like you said, somebody having some event and then we're not there. Why does that bother me so much? And we can just lay there for so long and, and not, and it stirs us up rather than calms us down. Is there mm -hmm. anything in particular that you recommend people focus their minds on as they're going to sleep? I know we can just have the spiritual answer of scripture or whatever, which is great, but I don't know if there's any sort of scientific thing about, I don't know, daydreaming or anything like that that helps people to calm down. Well, a lot of times what I recommend um, is having a focus word. Uh, and basically, it's a word that, that has meaning to where you're at in your life. So if you're feeling hopeless, your, your focus word might be hope. And it's the, the goal is so that you're not focusing on the negative emotion feeling uh, situation, but that you're constantly flipping it back to the positive thought process. Scripture works well. Um, sometimes it's hard to kind of find that key scripture that really um, hits you. Um, but so if you can find one that really speaks to you, then that's a great way of doing it. But what I find sometimes is at night, particularly because you're wanting your mind to relax, Scripture is so in depth and alive mm -hmm. that you do better to focus on one word. And sometimes it's, a, it's an attribute of God that I have people focus on because um, sometimes that's the hardest journey is to, because even just in my own personal story, I, I had a hard time trusting God. That was a big part of me wanting to have the control. I had a hard time trusting because I knew that I'm not always going to like his outcome. I'm not going to always like how he does things but I still have to trust his heart in that process. And so it was a word that for me, when I'm stressed or when things happen that I don't understand, the word I focus on is love because I, I, I believe that he is love, even if what I'm feeling is not lovely mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's so good. 
So we've talked about how to kind of calm our mind down before bed. Uh, I want to back up just a smidge to that transition that we often have to make between I'm sitting on the couch actually watching TV or on my phone or talking with my family or whatever, and I need to transition to go to bed. And I don't know if this is ever a difficult transition for you um, or, or any of those listening, but I know for me, that's often where I'm like, oh, I'm, re- I'm resting here on the couch. I'm just going to scroll on my phone a little bit more. And mentally, it's so hard for me to make that shift of, okay, I need to get up and go to bed now. Do you have any suggestions or tips for transitioning from what feels like rest in scrolling on our phones to what is actual rest going to bed? Yes. Um, And I love that you said that because that's what I hear from a lot of people when I ask them, when, you know, do they rest? They say, yeah, I rest on the weekend. You know, I I hang out and watch some Netflix series and and things like that. And they're, you know, they have, they're, they're doing things where they're not doing their typical work, but really what I like for you to think about is when you're thinking about doing something that you're calling rest, be able to tell me what is being restored in that moment. Mm. Because if it's true rest, there should be something restored. There should be a restoration of something. Rest takes us back to a prior state. It starts with the RE. We're going to return to the prior state of how something started. So if, so for instance, sometimes people will say, well, you know, I'm drained because I had all these negative people at work. Well, how are you restoring that? You restore that about by being around positive life giving people who you enjoy their company with. And so Facebook, I mean, what is being restored for most people? It's not usually it's actually right. more draining. It's, it's socially taxing. And so for people who enjoy that social aspect, because that means that that's a part of something that's important to you, that social connection, I recommend who, who is still available that you can have that social connection with before going to bed. If you're married, then it could be a spouse actually spending some face-to-face time. One of the, the most interesting um, emails that I get are emails from men who have not read Sacred Rest, who write me from my website to tell me how their marriage has changed after their wife read my suggestion about Mm. that spending face-to-face time with their husband so that they can get that connection back. Um, And and so it's very interesting to me because what happens is when we, when we really start thinking about rest equals restoration, we stop calling things that are just different activities rest because we can't tell what's been restored. But when we're looking for the restoration in it, you'll focus your attention on activities that actually make you feel better. I'm glad you're wearing a headset mic because this would be like a mic drop moment. That was so good. I love that concept because I guess that makes the rest that so many of us do more of an escape than an actual restoration. Exactly. And that's the thing, the escapism that um, sometimes we get into, and I'm all for a great novel, a great movie and all of that, because honestly, there have been times when I have, you know, watched a movie or read a book and I could tell something got restored because I'm like, oh, that, you know, that was so motivational or inspirational or whatever. I could tell something improved, but, but then there are those that I do just for pure entertainment Mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm not going to call that rest because then when I do just the pure entertainment or pure, purely for information, which is what oftentimes is happening with social media, I'm either looking at it for entertainment, I want to be entertained with what's going on with my friends' lives and see what's going on with them or for information about what's going on with their life. But it's not really restoring anything inside of me. You know, honestly, if most of us are honest, our social media interaction is draining. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it yep. pulls us more than it, than it restores us. Absolutely. I don't think I'm going to think about rest the same again. Rest equals restoration. That's so good. And honestly, it's so challenging because the next time I go to sit down and watch whatever or do whatever, I know that's going to pop into my head and I'm going to think, I'm not really resting right now. Okay, what would actually, you know, allow me to rest? And so, you know, actually, for those listening, I challenge you right now to grab a pen and paper and jot down maybe five things that would truly make you feel restored in the ways that you often need to at the end of the day. Um, So just do that while you're listening right now. Grab a pen, paper, 
jot down a few things or even just think about what are the things that would actually make you feel restored after the end of the day. Um, Okay, so we've talked about the process of going to bed. How can we wake up in a way that is restful? Because, you know, I used to wake up to my kids kind of jumping on me. That was not a restful way to wake up. I've woken up to blurring alarm clocks or the ones that gently sort of (laughs) wake you up. Is there a specific way of waking up that, that works better than others? Scientifically, the best way to wake up is with morning light. But I think most of us would have a hard time doing that. The gradual, um, as the sun comes up, that's how our bodies best respond with our circadian rhythms. Because as if you have a window that's open, um, but it gets dark enough in your room that you, because it should be dark when you're going to sleep, and then it should lighten as the day comes forth. And that's the way the body's kind of programmed. Now, the thing is, that's not realistic for most of us. Mm-hmm. We, you know, our setup is, and is not so that that would work. And even our lifestyles sometimes are not so that that would work. So what I have been doing is, um, and this is very specific, but this is what I found to be the most effective for me. I don't like alarms. I don't like sounds buzzing. I don't like all of that. That rattles my nerves. And so I wake up automatically frazzled. And what I found is I do best when I wake up with the gentle buzzing of my um, my um, fitness tracker. I don't want to use brand names, but my oh, fitness no, tracker. You, no, use one because I have one that I mention a lot that I really like. Oh, so I'm curious okay. to know what you use. So I, I'm using the Fitbit yes. Alta. Uh, I'm the same as a I doctor. Can, this is awesome. I can pretty it up. Is that so? so I can wear it whenever I'm at the office or really I wear it to anything but I can pretty it up with the little bands that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the fact that I can set a silent alarm on it and it gives yes. just this little buzz. And so that is almost like someone kind of gently shaking you and saying, wake up. <laughs> Whereas when that al- alarm blares in my head, I automatically, my fight or flight, and that's all of us, it kicks in. Mm-hmm. So if you have a way of either setting a white noise alarm where, you know, rain or water or something like that starts playing rather than the, the beep, beep, beep sound. That's a little bit better. Um, some some um, clocks now have a graduated system where it starts off at the lowest volume setting with the white noise and it gradually gets louder um, the longer it takes for you to wake up. Yeah. Up, so that kind of brings you out of sleep instead of jarring you out of sleep. And so I think anything that can gently wake you up uh, is best. Okay. And as you kind of get more into the habit of sleeping deeply, then when you wake up, you don't want something to jar you, <laughs> you know, out of sleep. Cause that's, that's traumatic. It's not a great way to start your morning. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the Fitbit because that I love, that's my favorite thing about it, honestly, is the, the, the vibrating alarm because it also doesn't wake up my husband if I'm waking up mm-hmm. earlier. And so I'm not quite, it's not like I'm waking up to DEFCON 9 desperately trying to find the alarm clock and turn it off before my husband wakes up. It's just this little thing on my wrist that I know is bothering no one but me and it's waking me up slowly. I do set like five of them just to make sure that all the little gentle vibrations eventually wake me up. But um, so here's a question for you that is is also kind of specific. So on a lot of fitness trackers, like the ones that we've mentioned, um, they have like this sleep tracking. Is that a valid thing? Is that helpful, accurate, or is that sort of more of a gimmick? I think it's helpful um, just for you to have a general idea of how many hours you're getting because that can be very deceptive for most people. Um, as far as the accuracy on some of them now, we'll try to tell you if you're in REM and non-REM. And that gets tricky because there's a lot of underlying sleep disorders, sleep apnea and snoring and different things that will tweak kind of how the, the um, machine will respond. So those aren't as accurate, but most of them are very accurate about letting you know how many total hours you receive, you mm-hmm. of sleep you got. And I think that's beneficial because, you know, over 40 million people, a third of the population is chronically sleep deprived. And a lot of that, uh, you know, kind of feeds into every other area of their life. And so, yes, they need to get more rest so that they can sleep better. But the ultimate goal is that you you must get enough sleep. I mean, that's required mm-hmm. just for your body to, to, to feel energized because that's when the restoration in the cells happens. That's when the neurons are are are, um, regenerated. So you have to eventually get high quality sleep because that's when the healing occurs inside of our body. 
That's so good. I realized that a couple of weeks ago. We recently transitioned to my kids being back in school. I have high schoolers who are staying up late trying to finish homework, and then an you know uh, intermediate schooler who is you know getting up a little bit earlier. And so, you know, my sleep schedule was just way off, and I started to really feel it. I felt like I was sort of going through the day in a little bit of a haze. And mm -hmm. so, for those of you who need a little extra motivation, what I did was I contacted two of my friends and I said, "Okay, y'all." I'm going to bed at this time and not getting out of bed until this time. Otherwise, if I don't do that for the next seven days, I'm giving each of you a $20 Starbucks gift card. And <laughs> it worked. I, may, I did not want to go to bed several times and I wanted to get out of bed earlier several times. But I just, you know, I went to bed and I stayed in bed and I felt so much better after that period of time. Because I didn't, I mean, I love my friends, but I didn't want to give them <laughs> I didn't want to spend $40 <laughs> on them. And this, now they tease me because I've done this so much for different things that they're like, someday I'm going to get my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but for, you know, I, it's just interesting to see how how much of a difference it made in my um, what I wanted to eat and how I wanted to eat. Just I wanted the 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 quick energy carbohydrate things when I was tired. And I felt like I couldn't focus as well at work and I wasn't as passionate about it. Um, I was just so much more tired. So it's just amazing the impact that sleep has. And then I love how we're talking about just rest in general on top mm -hmm. of that. Um, so tell us a little bit about where people can find you online and where they can get a copy of your book. Uh, well, I would definitely like for most people to consider doing the rest quiz at restquiz.com. Yes. That's um, where they can determine which of the seven types of rest that they may be deficient in. Um, and then on my main website at ichoosemybestlife.com, there's a lot of free resources, in, including a um, version five-day study on the book Sacred Rest, as well as a 30-day uh, free Sacred Rest Challenge. And the book Sacred Rest is reco it Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity is really available wherever books are sold. Awesome. Hey, can we wrap up with one question? Uh, just for those people listening that are like, rest sounds good, but I need to be super mom and rest is kind of more of a luxury thing. I, I, I didn't touch on that as much as I wanted to. Can you speak into that a little bit, maybe just even to give them permission to focus on their rest today? Oh, absolutely. And that's, that is such a lie from the enemy. You know, um, one of my favorite scriptures it starts off with, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that's what this mindset that rest is this extra thing that we can do on the side is doing to people. It's killing their passion. It's destroying their ability to, to do the things that they want to do. And it's got people in this situation where rest looks like it's not beneficial. And really, it is the key to being able to accomplish more, to be more energized, to love your family with everything you've got, all of these areas where we feel like we are are not enough, a lot of that has to do with because we feel like we don't have what, what it takes. We don't have the energy. We don't have the passion. We don't have the drive for it. And rest is what restores that. That's what pours back into us so that we can really give our best selves to those people we care about. Mm, that's so good. You know, it made me think about, I've been watching tennis a lot the past couple of weeks, and they were talking about just the schedules of the matches and how, you know, they need a day off because they had a five-set match the day before. And I think if, if we force ourselves, whether we are or we aren't, if we force ourselves to think of ourselves like athletes— you know, I, I don't think that any of us are any different than an athlete. Our bodies don't operate differently. Athletes just push themselves to a different physical level. But those athletes have to rest. They need that rest or else they just, you know, their body will break down and, and they can't compete and they can't do what they were made to do. And it can be easy to, for us to not think of ourselves like that and, and think, you know, I, that we are super people or that we just exist mentally and emotionally and that we're not, you know, just physical beings that our bodies have limits and they need to be restored. And um, anyway, that, that was just a helpful way for me to, to think of it on kind of a practical level. Oh, I am maybe to a lesser degree, but I am just like an athlete and I need that rest in order to operate optimally. That's so true because it's, it's, it really is exactly the same, whether it's in the physical or the emotional, the mm -hmm. spiritual, creative, whatever the area is, the way that you get, the way you stay on top is by allowing your body to have those periods of rest. It's just part of the cycle. We 
exercise, quote unquote, mm-hmm. whatever that is, and we rest and that they're, they're actually two necessary things in order for us to grow and to move forward. So good. Absolutely. All right. Well, you guys definitely check out her rest quiz because really who doesn't love taking a quiz? So go check that out. Go check out Sandra's site and get a copy of her book. Sandra, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed our chat today with Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. And I want to thank our podcast producer, Sarah Jane Menifee, and our podcast editor, Chris Mann from ProdShaper.com for making this show happen and all of our episodes happen. If you need more resources for your morning, be sure to check out the Hello Mornings book. You can download the free first chapter at HelloMorningsBook.com. And if you want the links to anything we mentioned in the show today, be sure to check out the show notes for this episode over at hellomornings.org. Just click on the link for today's show right there on the homepage. All right, my name is Kat Lee, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. And I'll see you next time on the next episode of the Hello Mornings podcast. It's early in the morning, the house is quiet. Set aside this time for you I bow before the throne of a noble king And in this place my heart begins to sing It's gonna be a good day A good day filled with his grace His grace and sweet new mercy May my thoughts obey Jesus to walk in his way by his spirit with each breath that I take. It's feeling like a God day. This song is called God Day by Jen Stanbro. You can get your copy at iTunes, Amazon, or jenstanbro.com. <laughs>